of the chest demonstrates a prominent pulmonary arteriovenous malformation streak with a discrete, single feeding pulmonary artery streak. Axial CTA of the same patient demonstrates the feeding artery street and draining vein of the right lower lobe PAVM. This non-invasive proprocedural CT allows assessment of feeding vessel caliber and location. Careful planning for the intervention ultimately results in decreased procedural time, contrast, and radiation exposure. Selective DSA in the same patient demonstrates the right lower lobe PAVM once the feeding pulmonary artery branch is selected. There is excellent correlation with the procedure CTA used for planning. Embolization coils were used to occlude the feeding artery of the PAVM. The sheath and catheter are positioned within the feeding artery. Cross-sectional imaging and multiple reformations are important in procedure planning for carotid artery. Cross-sectional imaging and multiple reformations are important in procedure planning for carotid artery stenting. This coronal maximum intensity projection shows a severe stenosis. Saint of the left internal carotid artery with normal caliber of the eca distally and the common carotid artery proximally. Sagittal MIP confirms the severe stenosis street and a normal caliber distal left eca. The arterial caliber impacts the types and sizes of stent and embolic protection devices chosen. Points can be plotted on the reformatted images from the same CTA using post-processing software on a dedicated workstation. Calculations of the minimum street and maximum diameters along the arterial course are made. The degree of stenosis street is evaluated on this image. Precise measurements of arterial diameter are important for stent sizing. The normal distal eca diameter impacts sizing of an embolic protection device, if used. The eca diameter street at the distal end of the stenosis is calculated here. The patient was being evaluated for possible carotid artery stenting because of a history of prior carotid endarterectomy and new onset of slurred speech. The CTA shows a severe left eca stenosis. An intraoperative DSA correlates well with the procedural CTA and confirms the severe eca stenosis. The CTA results indicated that the patient was anatomically suitable for carotid stenting with embolic protection. D reformation shows a satisfactory infraranal neck length above and triple A and both distal common iliac arteries street are dilated. Careful procedural analysis of aortoiliac anatomy is critical to choosing an appropriate endograph forever. A centerline street has been plotted on the coronal MIP in the aortic and left common iliac artery lumina from the lowest renal artery street to the iliac bifurcation. This is used to calculate endograft length and is usually more accurate than using axial table positions. Proprocedural axial CECT images are used to calculate diameters at multiple levels. In this image, the aortic neck diameter below the lowest renal artery street is 24. 5 mm diameter, evaluated over a 10 minus 15 mm length. Other important diameters include the aortic bifurcation and the common and external iliac arteries. A worksheet is used to plot vessel lengths and diameters from CTA image data. Appropriate endograft size and component lengths are then selected. Shows an endo DSA during EVA shows an endograft extending from the lowest renal artery to both iliac bifurcations. The suprarenal endograft component street consists of bare metal stents designed to aid in proximal fixation. Meticulous preoperative planning is critical to obtaining good EVA outcomes. 3D reformatted CTA three months after ever shows patency of the renal arteries street, superior mesenteric artery, and both internal street and external. Iliac arteries. Axial images showed a good endograft position and no endoleak. Ever. Post-procedural imaging surveillance. 10. Proprocital enhanced T1WIC plus mister in a patient with no uterine fibroids shows a large, heterogeneously enhancing fibroid street. MISTER is the preferred modality for preuterine artery embolization evaluation, clearly demonstrating the size and location of fibroids as well as the degree of enhancement. Selective left uterine artery DSA via a coaxial microcatheter street shows extensive vascularity, corresponding to the fibroid enhancement seen on MISTER embolization was performed from this catheter position. Localizing GI bleeding can be difficult, particularly given its intermittent nature. TC99M labeled red blood cell scintigraphy before DSA can determine if there is active bleeding and its location. Here, 
activity in the left abdomen accumulates in a small bowel distribution. As scintigraphy suggested, bleeding localized to a jejunal branch of SMA. Evaluation of celiac and IMA arteries was unnecessary, limiting contrast load and radiation dose during treatment. This shows a 1.5 cm enhancing mass street in segment 8 and a 3.5 cm enhancing mass street in segment V, consistent with hepatocellular carcinoma. Cross-sectional imaging with Mr. or CT assesses tumor number, location, and vascularity, plus vascular anatomy prior to taste, and is more sensitive than intraprocedural DSA. Proprocedural imaging helps plan TACE as bilateral staged, lobar, or segmental. Here, a selective coaxial microcather to street confirms masses in segments 8 and V. Axial CECT demonstrates an exophytic, enhancing, fat-containing mass involving the right kidney representative of an angiomyelipoma. Sagittal CECT confirms the exophytic nature of the right renal angiomyelipoma. Proprocedural imaging suggests that, due to the location of the mass, a partial nephrectomy may be challenging. Alternatively, no barriers to endovascular embolization are apparent. A non-selective right renal arteriogram demonstrates arterial blush and neovascularity associated with the exophytic angiomyelipoma. A coaxial microcatheter was advanced until this superselective right renal arteriogram street demonstrated arterial blush street of the angiomyelipoma, correlating well with the procedure caught. Particle embolization from this location treated the angiomyelipoma and minimized injury to uninvolved kidney. Ultrasound mapping of the deep and superficial veins of the lower extremities and color Doppler evaluation of venous reflux are mandatory prior to thermal ablation of varicose veins. This case demonstrates 9 seconds of reflux street in the left great saphenous vein, indicating the presence of venous insufficiency. Color Doppler US shows a large, refluxing superficial very street located within the posterior thigh. Proprocedure duplex ultrasound should include evaluation for incompetent perforators as well. Procedure with moderate sedation. Procedure with moderate sedation is shown. Pulse and oxygen saturation are continuously monitored. Blood pressure is taken every five minutes. Entidal CO street and respiratory rate street can also be monitored. This patient was hyperventilating. CO Pre-procedural planning and imaging procedural angiogram. No next of kin was available. Presumed moderate sedation is shown. Pulse and oxygen saturation are continuously monitored. Blood pressure is taken every five minutes. Entidal CO street and respiratory rate street can also be monitored. This patient was hyperventilating. CO contrast is an alternative for patients unable to receive iodinated contrast. Here, CO injection via a catheter in the hepatic vein opacifies the portal vein and esophageal varices during tips. CT shows. Axial CECT shows a patient who sustained significant trauma after being stuck by a car. Insignificant comminuted pelvic fractures are present as is evidence of contrast extravasation street. Patient had concomitant head injuries and was intubated. No next of kin was available. Presumed consent was invoked to proceed with pelvic angiogram and embolization. A right internal iliac angiogram shows multifocal areas of extravasation. These were treated with gelfoam embolization. Patient was ASA class 5E. Ant Anteroposterior DSA of the left common femoral artery shows a focal, eccentric, high-grade stenosis. Note the numerous collaterals that are present, further confirming the significance of the stenosis. Postangioplasty DSA shows a normal luminal caliber at the site of prior stenosis. A guide wire was left in place across the stenosis until angiographic confirmation of a satisfactory result. The collaterals no longer fill. Angioplasty, with or without stent placement, is the recommended treatment for symptomatic central venous stenosis by the Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative. PTA has high initial angiographic success. However, PTA disrupts the vessel intima and triggers accelerated neointimal hyperplasia. Also, CVS primary stenting does not improve primary pattern C versus PTA. Thus, Avoid any intervention in asymptomatic patients. Photo photograph, of photograph of an inflated angioplasty balloon shows radiopic markers street denoting margins beyond which the balloon tapers. These markers facilitate optimal positioning of the balloon during PTA. A diabetic patient with rest pain and an ischemic foot ulcer underwent angiography. 
and infrapopliteal runoff shows high-grade stenosis of the anterior tibial and perineal. Artery 3 FR catheter was advanced to the infrapopliteal artery. After administering 5,000 units of heparin, a guide wire was advanced across the anterior tibial stenosis. 0.014 diameter guide wires are often used in infrapopliteal vessels. An angioplasty balloon has been advanced over the wire. Positioned to bridge the stenosis and inflated. A waste. Indents the balloon at the level of the stenosis. The balloon diameter was based upon measurements of the target vessel. With continued balloon inflation, using an insufflator to achieve approximately 10 atmospheres of pressure, the waste is eliminated, which is necessary for successful angioplasty. DSA after balloon removal shows a normal vessel caliber where a stenosis was previously seen. The guide wire was left in place across the stenosis until DSA confirmed a good result. This allows continued access across the lesion in the event that additional treatment is necessary, or in case a complication occurs. Microsurgical blades street are fixed longitudinally to the surface of a non-compliant angioplasty balloon, which upon inflation expands radially, delivering incisions into the plaque. The semi-compliant balloon is encircled by flexible rectangular nitinol struts saying the design is intended to focus uniform radial force along the edges of the nitinol, scoring the plaque and resulting in a more precise and predictable angioplasty outcome. Evaluation of a, fa evaluation of a failing hemodialysis fistula shows stenosis at the arteriovenous anastomosis street and an adjacent stenotic lesion street within the fistula. The fistula was non-pulsatile, with poor flow. Following conventional angioplasty with a high-pressure balloon, there is only minimal improvement of the previously demonstrated venous stenosis. The luminal diameter approximates that of the catheter that lies within the vessel. Subsequently, repeat angioplasty was performed with a scoring balloon. It was hoped that the additional force from the nitinol struts street encircling the balloon would yield a more satisfactory result than that of the initial conventional venous angioplasty. Venography following the scoring balloon angioplasty shows a marked improvement in the appearance of the previously noted venous stenosis. A palpable thrill was present in the fistula afterward. Graphic shows a cryoplasty balloon street inflated with liquid nitrous oxide, lowering its temperature to 10 degrees Celsius, theoretically causing altered plaque response, decreased recoil, and cellular apoptosis, with the goal of reducing restenosis. Fluoroscopic image shows an inflated cryoplasty balloon. Note the distinctive balloon markings. Diffuse SFA stenosis is shown before and after cryoplasty. After cryoplasty, vessel diameter is improved, but fine dissection channels parallel the treated zone. A selective left renal arteriogram shows a proximal high-grade stenosis with either marked post-stenotic dilatation or an aneurysm distal to the stenosis. There is also a distal filling defect, which appears to represent anirismal thrombus. DSA imaging later in the arterial phase of the injection shows an early nephrogram, filling of distal intraranal arterial branches, and persistence of the filling defect. The findings in these images are atypical for an atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Angioplasty was performed with a slightly oversized balloon over a guide wire. Post-PTA contrast extravasation occurred from the aneurysm. Several angioplasty principles were ignored. 1. PTA of a stenosis adjacent to an aneurysm increases rupture risk. 2. The balloon should not have been oversized to such a degree. And 3. A wire should have been left across the lesion until success is confirmed. Without guide wire access, a balloon could not be inflated for tamponade, and nephrectomy was necessary. Axial pathologic specimen from an artery following angioplasty shows the hyperplastic intima with clefts caused by inflation of the angioplasty balloon. The muscular media, which is seen surrounding the intima, typically responds to angioplasty through stretching, not tearing, thereby preserving vascular integrity. Abdominal aortogram via a pigtail catheter reveals multiple renal arteries bilaterally with a high-grade stenosis in the dominant right renal artery. A 4FR cobra catheter was coaxially introduced over an 0.035 inches guide wire into the dominant right renal artery beyond the stenosis. The 0.035 inches wire was removed and DSA was performed. And 0.014 inches guide wire was introduced, the Cobra catheter was removed, and a rapid exchange angioplasty balloon was introduced coaxially through the guiding catheter. 
Contrast injection through the guiding catheter shows that the balloon should be pulled back slightly to center on the stenosis. During, P during PTA, at waist, indents the balloon, confirming correct positioning. The guiding catheter tip buttresses the balloon to prevent movement into the aorta. The guide wire remains in place. DSA via the guiding catheter revealed a suboptimal result to angioplasty, as often occurs with orificial renal artery stenosis. Subsequently, a balloon expandable stent was deployed, which markedly improved flow. The 0.014 inches was not removed until after the stent was securely deployed. Graphic Graphic shows the rotating blade street and cutting window street of a directional atherectomy device. Excised atherosclerotic plaque is collected in a chamber at the tip of the device. DSA shows the cutting window street of a directional atherectomy device in the common femoral artery. The nose cone, used for collection of excised plaque, extends into the SFA. Eccentric plaque is present. Peripheral rotoblator, the peripheral rotoblator is an example of a rotational atherectomy device. Available at 1.25 to 2.5 mm diameter, it tracks over a 0.014 inches wire. Theoretically, the device pulverizes plaque as it spins, limiting the risk of occlusive distal emboli. The Jetstream atherectomy device removes excised debris via an aspiration port, reducing the risk of embolization. Multiple smaller infusion ports maintain a steady stream of fluid to allow aspiration. Front cutting blade street and expandable blades to bulk plaque. Angiography shows a high grade stenosis in the distal common femoral artery at the level of the bifurcation into the superficial street and profunda femoral street arteries. The eccentric stenosis at the SFA origin street is best seen in RAL, and the high grade profunda femoral artery origin stenosis street is best seen in LAL. This is a difficult lesion for either angioplasty or stenting because of the two adjacent arterial origins. Surgical endarterectomy or atherectomy is a better treatment option.